a, a child of about five during during the first Earth Day celebration. I, you know, back then there wasn't a whole lot to celebrate necessarily, but it was created and, and has uh, lasted all these years, which is excellent. In about 15 later years later uh, from the first Earth Day, I attended started to attend the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Wisconsin Green Bay UWGB was founded in Earth on Earth Day in 1969 and was meant to be the environmental school in Wisconsin with, by 1985, 16 environmental buildings planned. By the time I attended there, they still only had one biology building, which sort of gives us a little hint of the uh, value of ecology in society now. There are, have been a lot of good things that have happened in the last 30 years ecologically in the natural world, and, and there's a lot of wins, so should we, we should so celebrate those things. I didn't attend my first Earth Day until I was about 20 or so, and I was in Madison, Wisconsin. One of the uh, speakers, is one of the founders of the original Earth Day, was Hugh Iltis, who was a botanist at University of Wisconsin. He was a botany professor, and he was there at the first day, Earth Day celebration. He was important because in the 1970s, he helped to publicize and, and bring to the world's attention the existence of an ancestral perennial corn. And, and this was found in the islands of Mexico, Zia Diplo Prentice. And it was found in a spot where it only occurred in a few acres of land outside of Mexico City. And those acres of land were slated for development. As a perennial corn, of course, you recognize its huge potential for providing more sustainable grain resources for humanity. And all that, although that promise has not really manifest as yet for perennial corn, it highlights the importance of agriculture for humanity, human well-being, and for the planet. Agriculture is a dominant land use across the world and almost everywhere we can think of in the world is really a working landscape. Nebraska has led the world in the development of industrial and highly efficient agriculture. This has helped feed the world for sure, but it's a pretty recent development of highly irrigated agriculture, and it hasn't really withstood the test of time. That is to say, its resilience has not really been tested. And resilience matters. Resilience matters for a lot of reasons, partly because this is a rapidly changing world we live in, as we're all aware. We've been losing arable land. Uh, withdrawals of fresh water from rivers and lakes are increasing. Coral reefs, it looks like we may leave, lose coral reefs as an ecosystem pretty soon. We're starting to get bleaching events that are uh, affecting 90% of corals. And recent studies showed 70% of insect biomass lost in much of Europe. So there's some bad signals going out there. Meanwhile, agriculture has increased by 70% just by 2050, not many years, to meet the increase in demand for food and fiber. So sustainable, agri sustainable intensification of agriculture is a challenge for humanity. It's going to require fostering resilient working landscapes and transforming landscapes that are in undesirable condition. The planet's rapidly changing. I'm sure we all know this. There's stresses that were underway, global change, climate change, etc., often interact. The responses are nonlinear and sudden. For example, melting in the tundra is starting to release methane. That speeds up melting, which releases more methane. So nonlinear responses. And we need a, a, a framework to understand that change. And so resilience may be that framework. Meanwhile, US and global populations are still increasing. But food production is lagging behind the increase in, in people. So somehow we've got to reconcile this within the next 30 years. Our humanity is going to have some major issues to deal with. We've met, in many cases, planetary boundaries. We're meeting them now. So this concept of planetary boundaries has been out for a few years, and we're reaching some of these boundaries. 
our actions in agriculture and otherwise have effects elsewhere in the world too. For example, corn, soybean, agriculture in Nebraska is partially responsible for the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Increasing corn production in the Great Plains increases rainforest destruction in Brazil. World systems are coupled or telecoupled. So again, a grand challenge for humanity, or one of many perhaps, is managing trade-offs in agriculture, or, or managing and increasing productivity in agriculture while managing trade-offs, both good and bad trade-offs. And it's important because agricultural systems throughout human history have collapsed in this valley because of changes in, in monsoon cycles hundreds of years ago, collapsed as an agricultural landscape. Mesopotamia, one you're probably all familiar with, collapsed because of salinization leading from, resulting from irrigation, over-irrigation. The Murray Darling, which is a basin in Australia, is currently collapsing. The soils are being waterlogged because trees were cut down to put uh, agriculture in place and trays the water table with irrigation. So collapsing. And collapse, of course, agriculture collapse. This happened close to home. This isn't far from here. It's not that many years ago. The Dust Bowl, of course. So these causes of major disruptions to our natural systems or natural and human systems could be really local, local drought, as we see, causing, say, fires in western Nebraska right now. Or it can be more global, like changing climate, leading changing composition of species, and that leading to the loss of grasslands and, and replacement of grasslands by woodlands in much of Nebraska. So what we often see in a resilient sense is that collapse leads to the emergence of something new, right? So we can lose productive agriculture like in the Dust Bowl, and it can either be productive agriculture or it can be Dust Bowl. We can have rangelands that are in a grass state, if you will, or with just a little change, lack of change, a loss of fire, that rangeland, grassland can, can um, switch to woodland. And that's a, that's a regime change that we have happening in Nebraska. We lose about 50,000 acres a year of our rangeland is being lost to grassland. So over the last century, we've lost a significant portion of our rangeland. In the sand hills, similarly, just a rangeland example, we can have sand hills, or sand hills could exist in as uh, open blowing dunes or as woodlands also. And if there's a lot of effort going on right now in the sand hills and much of Nebraska to prevent the loss of rangeland to woodland, really an invasive species problem. And so what's resilience? Resilience has come, you've probably all heard it. Have you ever watched um, the news hour on PBS, they end up with this, the, one of the uh, sponsors says, and resilience is being able to pivot over and over again. So this is really, resilience is really a scientific term, but it has some real lay um, definitions as well. And in fact, there's two competing definitions, and, and probably what everybody thinks of when they think of resilience is what we call engineering resilience. And it's really a simple concept. You get this perturbed, and this could be you as a human having emotional damage from, say, COVID experiences, or it could be an ecosystem that's flooded, then resilience in that definition is simply the rate of return. How long does it take for you to recover? And it's a really easy to measure um, metric, but there's no theory behind it. So, so it's interesting. You can measure it. It is important to know how quickly you can bounce back, but it's a really partial definition Resilience. This way I consider resilience as ecological or social ecological resilience. And that includes bounce back and recovery, because that's what happens most of the time when a person or any kind of complex system is disturbed, usually there's recovery. But sometimes, when I was talking about alternative stable states, sometimes the system is disturbed so much that it just fundamentally changed. 
goes to an alternative stable state, the switch from grassland to woodland. And that is a huge change in ecological systems. And so in, in the definition I use, the definition of resilience is the amount of disturbance a system can take before it suddenly transitions to a completely different system with different structure and function. That change from rangeland to woodland is a very fundamental one. These degraded systems, when there's a change like this, which humans often just experience as surprise, like who would have thought my grassland would be a woodland? Those changes that do occur are usually undesirable for humans. For example, losing rangeland in Nebraska, a rangeland state that focuses on cattle production, is bad for human food security, for livelihoods, and it's bad for grassland birds and animals that need prairies and grasslands. So another thing to keep in mind is that Resilience is just a thing. It's a measure of this amount of disturbance. It's not good or bad. We often hear resilience termed in a normative sense. It's good to be resilient. But you could have a, a system in a very negative state, like a, a uh, rangeland that's turned to a woodland. It's highly resilient. That means it's just hard to switch it back to rangeland. They're very difficult in many cases. So when we manage for resilience, at least in agricultural systems, it's a little different than managing for efficiency. It's how ag is usually managed to get the most production and most profit. The problem with managing for efficiency is you have higher production during ideal conditions, but ideal conditions are never or rarely achieved. And so resilience seeks to more guarantee output over a wide range of conditions a little bit different there. And another reason we're concerned about resilience is something, a complicated word that um, many people probably haven't heard of, but it's interesting, hysteresis. So when these systems change, and here's the Platte River, this is Central Platte. Um, as you're probably aware, Central Platte used to be historically characterized as a wide braided river with open sandbars. Sandbars are critical for migratory species like uh, like whooping and sandhill cranes, and for terns and plovers. But through human actions, the river's been dammed. So this, the process that sort of structured that system, which was floods, had been stopped largely. And what's happened is the Platte River's gone to an alternative stable state. No longer is it open sandbars. It's um, stabilized uh, sandbars that are now full of vegetation. So what hysteresis says is that we've lost the process that kept this river the way we wanted it, at least for ecological uses, to be open sandbars so that cranes could use it. You'd think that we could just put floods in again and we'd get this back. But we can't because trees have grown and are invasive species like Phragmites have grown. So it'll, what hysteresis says is that we can't just replace the process and get that system back. We've got to do a lot, lot, lot more effort. You've got to go herbicide the river, which is actually done. It's done out of helicopters and, and like this. The entire river has been herbicide and killed Phragmites. Then you've got to kill the cottonwood trees. You've got to cut these down. And so when I first moved to Nebraska and saw tractors plowing the islands in the Platte River, I had no idea what's going on. Luckily, that was just to break up roots and get these sandbars back so that we can have maintained and healthy ecological systems. But because of hysteresis and because how hard it is to restore systems, it's usually in humanity's best interest to maintain systems in their desirable state and trying to put them back. So what do we do? How can we deal with systems that have lost their resilience and come to an undesirable state? I mean, I think one of the tenets of Earth Day is that we want uh, planet that's sustainable, ecologically healthy, and healthy for humans also, and therefore resilient. So what can we do? We can try to foster resilience in systems that are healthy, like rangelands. We're working on that across the state right now by putting fire back in the sandhills in a big way. Um, 
manage those trade-offs. Trade-offs are implicit and explicit, and we make them all the time. Avoid critical thresholds. Those critical thresholds are those tipping points. And you've heard the idea of tipping points between a desirable and an undesirable system. I'll try to avoid those. And foster transformation. So we're not just pawns to change, right? Human agency allows us, through this process of transformation, to take a system that's undesirable, like the Dust Bowl, and to make it a more desirable system again. We did that in the 1930s. It took national effort and sustained local collective action. And we restored the system back to an extremely productive agricultural system with a lot of effort, however. So finally, I'd simply like to end by saying this. Hugh Hiltis and others, I'm sure, would agree that sustainable agriculture is a key to a sustainable planet going forward. It takes up so much of our land use and is critical for, obviously, food security and human wellness. So agriculture is the linchpin for sustainable ability on planet Earth. I should mention that spot where Hugh had discovered perennial corn slated for development. So as I said, ecology is a dismal science often because we do highlight on these bad things. We try to fix them. So, so not always dismal. But there's some good news with, with the discovery of perennial corn. That original discovery, that location that was about to be developed in 19, I think the discovery is 1975, that was about to be developed and lost forever, this evolutionarily distinct perennial corn, is now a 450 square mile biosphere reserve. So there are good things happening, and 50 years later, or whatever it is since the first Earth Day, many things are looking up. So maintaining resilience in agriculture, I would contend, is a really important part of maintaining a sustainable planet. Thank you.